Palestine, 1947. British soldiers are looking for two comrades who've been kidnapped. They've been told the bodies are in this eucalyptus grove, but have been warned that the grove is mined. Their enemies in this vicious war are Jewish guerrillas, men and women driven by a sense of betrayal. They so hated the British because they betrayed our people. They prevented us from having our homeland. They hated our guts. Uh, we hated theirs, simple as that. This conflict was Britain's first encounter with a new kind of guerrilla warfare during the final years of empire. The birthplace of modern terrorism lies here in Jerusalem. In 1945, the city was the capital of the British-administered territory of Palestine. For nearly 30 years, Britain had been trying to balance the competing interests of Jews and Arabs. The High Commissioner, General Sir Alan Cunningham, presented orders and medals to a large number of people, Arabs and Jews. We were doing something which was really intrinsically impossible. We were trying to provide a national home in Palestine for the Jews on condition that nothing was done to affect the civil or religious liberties of the, the other people living there. And it really wasn't possible. The British administration was lodged in a section of the King David, Palestine's poshest hotel. Beautiful. The dining room was magnificent. The tables were laid out beautiful. It was really a magnificent hotel. As the Jewish guerrilla campaign got underway, the hotel became the target for one of the most spectacular terrorist attacks of the 20th century. Barker Azamar. The British commander had challenged us. He said, try to get into our fortress. It's one of the strongest in the Middle East. It was daring. It was great daring because it, it was a fortress. The King David was the Fort Knox of the Brits. The issue which drove a small minority of the Jews in Palestine to take up arms was the fate of the Holocaust survivors who tried to emigrate to Palestine after the war. The British wanted to severely restrict the numbers in order not to enrage the Arabs. Would-be immigrants were escorted to camps in Cyprus or interned. Images of Jews behind barbed wire, again, suggested a Jewish national home was now a distant dream. Why wouldn't the British open the gates of Palestine to us? Why? They had their orders from the Arabs? That's how we felt. Their masters were the Arabs. Their masters. The intention of the British statesmen was to stay here forever. They received a mandate to create here a Jewish uh, national home, which they didn't. They did the opposite. We said openly, our worst enemy are the British, and until they are chased away from here, there will never be a Jewish state. Those who wanted to join the fight against the British could only do so after strict vetting. Your imagination races and your knees buckle under you because you don't know what's waiting for you. Then there's a nice soft voice saying, good evening, you know why you're here. Adina Hai was joining the main guerrilla organization, the Irgun. Do you know what the Irgun stands for? And I say, yes, it stands for our liberation and making room for our friends in the diaspora to come here. Do you know what you have to do? I said, whatever I'm told. He said, put your hand on the Bible. And he said, say after me, 
They actually told us it's like getting married. I am Adina Chai. I'm swearing allegiance to the Agun. And then he says, until such time that we have independence and then we're free. The Irgun had only a few hundred members, a fraction of the Jewish population. The leader was Menachem Begin, later to become Prime Minister of Israel. His organization was innovative, developing methods of guerrilla fighting which are commonplace today. One speciality was kidnapping, as in its raid on the Forces Club in Tel Aviv, when five officers were snatched. The officers were to be used as bargaining chips to stop the British executing captured guerrilla fighters. This particular operation worked. The officers were released unharmed after the executions were stopped. The British were most outraged by a second, even smaller guerrilla outfit, the Stern Gang or group, which regularly concentrated on killing British soldiers. In one notorious incident, British paratroopers were surprised while camped in a car park in Tel Aviv. The fact that the soldiers were, were murdered in cold blood uh, without having to be able to defend themselves in any way at all was a complete surprise. We were shooting soldiers. They were shooting us, we were shooting them. They were killing our people without trial. We had to, to attack everywhere, every time, any time. On this occasion, seven paras were killed. British conscripts were confused. I couldn't make it out. I, I really couldn't understand it. You know, I thought we'd, uh, we'd behaved uh, pretty decently throughout the war uh, uh, and just couldn't make out why they hated us so much. You know, we weren't the Germans. We hadn't incarcerated them in, you know, death camps. British soldiers' attitude, to be perfectly frank, was that we hated the Jews and we loved the Arabs. I've been mean, com comparing them. So we didn't have anything to do with the Jews. We didn't really have anything to do with the Arabs either, but at least uh, the Arabs didn't murder us or didn't try and murder us. They just tried to steal everything from us. The skill of the guerrilla attacks put the troops on the defensive. The soldiers had been taught to fight conventional wars, but what they needed was training in fighting guerrillas in counterinsurgency. Certainly my unit didn't have any counterinsurgency training. We didn't have time to have it, and I don't know who would have given it anyway. We didn't get that training at all. We, well, we just acted naturally. We did what we thought we had to do under the circumstances. If we were called to a scene where people were shooting, well, we shot too. Towards the end of 1945, the Irgun began to plot its biggest operation yet, the destruction of the British headquarters at the King David. The chief planner, cover named Dead Alive, was on the police wanted list. So for him, hanging around outside the hotel was dangerous. I had the idea of walking around with the girls so we looked like lovers. It happened more than once that we were stopped and had to show our IDs. So it wasn't easy. We used to sit in the YMCA opposite. Sit in the cafe drinking coffee. And watch what was going on. Snooping around, Ellis noticed that there was a cafe in the basement of the hotel. It was elegant. 
such fine china, you would hardly dare to touch it. <laughs> then all this round, it was round like that, it was all tables. It's not everyone that went into it, because it was very expensive. Conveniently for Ellis, the cafe lay immediately below the British offices. Then Ellis noticed something else, at the other end of the hotel. There was a sunken driveway leading to the service entrance. The gates were frequently opened. Surprisingly, they were unguarded. I spotted a small lorry loaded with milk churns and sacks of vegetables and three to four Arab porters. When they reached the kitchen service entrance and I saw the churns being unloaded by the Arab porters, I realized I had found our way into the hotel. Irene Lewis used to travel every day to the King David where she worked as an army clerk. We were taken from Allenby Barracks where we were living on a three-tonner every morning to the outside of the hotel. The Jewish terrorists at that time had a nasty habit of laying mines on roads. And to be quite honest, that was the part that I found most harrowing. As long as I could get off that wagon outside the King David, I felt all right. It was a very well-built hotel. I never felt at risk in there. Jerusalem CID headquarters knew several months in advance that there would be an attack on the King David Hotel. We didn't know when and we didn't know how. We passed that information on to the chief secretary who regarded it as a case where you must maintain normalcy, as he called it. Sir John Shaw, the chief secretary, ran the Palestine administration at the King David. Beyond putting a bit of extra barbed wire around the place, he has appeared to treat it as not so much unlikely as don't let it deter us from doing what we have to do. That's administer the country. Brian Gibbs was a senior member of the British staff in the King David. His wife remembers how things were getting him down. He would say that uh, it was very difficult to concentrate on your work when um, all these dreadful things were going on around you. He couldn't relax at all. He was drinking and smoking more than usual. I mean, he didn't do any of that in England. But in July, there was good news. Joan was pregnant again, and Brian was getting a new posting. We started sorting out our possessions and letting, finding people to whom we could let the flat and so on. And uh, we then started looking forward to going. We really were quite cheerful. The Irgun planner, Schrager Ellis, wanted to put bombs in the basement cafe so that he could blow up the British offices above it. He knew he could get his bombers into the kitchen service entrance, but he needed to find out whether there was a corridor linking the service entrance with the basement cafe. Ellis and three Irgun colleagues dressed themselves up and braved the guards on the hotel door to pay the cafe a visit. We went in and sat at a table. We got in despite our fears. It was a most dangerous place for me. After all, I was a wanted man. In fact, we had a great time. Near the end of the evening, Ellis asked the girls to go to the toilet. I took the opportunity to walk out of the back door of the cafe. I started nosing around the corridor. It was deserted. I wandered along slowly until I got to the far end and saw the kitchen door. A tall, powerfully built man wearing a red fez came out of the kitchen. He was either a guard or a waiter. 
He asked me, in Arabic of course, why are you snooping around here? I answered with a little bit of English I knew. I am waiting. The ladies are in the toilet. I went back to our table. I got what I wanted. I now knew there was a corridor linking the service entrance with the cafe. The Irgun leader, Menachem Begin, now fixed the date for what he and his colleagues thought would be a great blow for national liberation. In my opinion, we were freedom fighters with the highest moral standards. On the morning of July the 22nd, the Gibbs family had breakfast together as usual. My son, who was four, my daughter, who was two, came with me to say goodbye to him. He kissed us all and waved and see you at lunchtime, and um, he went off down the road. If it had been my first operation, I would have been nervous. But as it was my 10th or 11th, I wasn't. We were going in with complete confidence. But if they kill us, well, so be it. It was a glorious day. I was very happy because the next day was my birthday. I would have been 23. Shortly before midday, a hijacked lorry trundled down the sunken driveway to the service entrance, which was, as usual, unguarded. Some of the squad went straight into the basement. We rounded everyone up and pushed them into the kitchen. We had to be very quick to avoid being discovered. Each of the seven churns was full of TNT and weighed 50 kilos. One British officer saw what was going on. I spotted a Brit officer hiding in the corridor. I pushed him with my gun, but he didn't move. My God, he was so tall and lanky. But one of my mates helped me move him. The tussle in the basement corridor was right next to the door of the army telephone exchange in the hotel. Sergeant Agnes Brown knew the British officer. I saw these two, as I thought, Arabs, because I had the Arab headdress on. And they were forcing Captain McIntosh up the corridor, up the basement corridor. I ran, and I went, actually, Stupid now and think about it. I went down to go after him. And one of the Arabs, as I thought an Arab, turned round and came towards me and pointed the gun at me. I got back and I phoned the office, spoke to Captain Chambers. He came over. I had to make tell him everything that had happened. So he said to me, right, leave it with me, because at that time, we didn't know what was happening. The officer went off, leaving a soldier to guard the telephonists. Everyone assumed they were dealing with Arab burglars. And Captain McIntosh, the one man who knew the truth, had been mortally wounded by the guerrillas. By now, all the milk churns have been laid round a pillar in the cafe. A warning in three languages said, will explode if moved. The bombs were set to go off in half an hour. It was now 12.15 p.m. A sergeant was sent down to the basement to find the intruders. Alerted by the firing, a soldier and a Palestine policeman were waiting for the bombers when they left. I'm rushing out shooting. I get hit in the knee. 
It was smashed. I couldn't pick it up, move it, or do anything with it. I started to hobble on one leg. Bullets were raining down on us from every direction. A smoke grenade was let off by one of the squad. Blood is spurting out. My leg is bust. I managed to get up to the street and around the corner to our escape car. It was now 12.20. 25 minutes to go. Meanwhile, one of Zadok's comrades wheeled a small decoy bomb into a position just down the road from the hotel. The police came racing round, but what interested them was not who had been in the hotel basement, but who had let off the decoy bomb. We went up to the roof of the hotel because the naffy was up there and we wanted a cup of tea and just stood looking over the side at the reinforcements who had by now arrived and were running around trying to find somebody, I suppose, but I dare say that anybody who was involved in planting it had gone ages ago. Unable to find the culprits, the police called off the search. But one person who knew the significance of the decoy bomb was the Irgun courier, Adina High. She was waiting outside a nearby pharmacy. When I heard the decoy bomb, immediately I rushed to that pharmacy. And then the digits were only four for a telephone. It means it didn't take you time to dial what you had to dial. I just said, this is the voice of the Hebrew resistance. Planted bombs in the King David. Please vacate the place. See, we warned you. And I ran for my life. Adina's warning to the hotel was passed on to the army security people. They said the call was almost certainly a hoax. They were a daily occurrence and should be ignored. The sound of the decoy bomb had reached Joan Gibbs, who lived quite close to the hotel. So I thought perhaps I'd better go and discover what was happening, although my husband always told me not to panic. So I went down, we didn't have a telephone, I went down to a friend's telephone, and I dialed the number of the King David, and it was ringing at the um, general uh, exchange but nobody was answering the phone. It was now 12.35, 10 minutes to go. Suddenly, the superintendent of the Jerusalem police turned up out of the blue. He found himself surrounded by agitated kitchen staff. They told him about Jews dressed as Arabs, dragging milk churns through the basement. Realizing there was a serious threat, he and an officer went down to the basement and set off for the cafe. So I thought, oh, well, all the other wives are ringing up too. I'll try again in a minute. And I put the phone down. And as I put it down, the blast of a second bomb came through the window. <laughs> If you can imagine a big iron tank, a water tank, and someone really taking a great bang at it with a sledgehammer, it was like that. Obviously a very much heavier one than the one before, and blew the window open and blew me across the room. It was just one big bang. It wasn't boom. You know, it was bang. The bomb had gone off eight minutes early. I heard all the side of the hotel falling down. The, uh, the stones, everything rattling down. It was, it was a dreadful experience. And we knew that it was our end of the hotel. 
it lasted for quite a while, actually. You could hear all these, um, these blocks of stone coming away from the walls. And then the great clouds of dust and smoke. More dust than smoke, I would say. And we went down and we had a look. And the whole of the corner of the southwest wing had collapsed. And there were pieces of reinforced concrete hanging down from the roof. Several big pieces of it. And there were soldiers frantically digging in the stones and the floor. And there were people lying on the pavement, lying on the road. Inside it looked like a cave. It obviously you see the full blast. There was no door or anything. And we started digging with our hands, see if we could find anybody. And eventually we found a body. Unfortunately, it was dead. I think we got seven or eight bodies out. Very soon after the attack, um, there was a mobile canteen arrived, and it was from Spinney's, a sort of a multiple store in Jerusalem. We thought, well, good old Spinney's, you know, and they um, dished out tea and stuff like that. A unit of Royal Engineers reached the hotel before dusk. They found themselves dealing with the first major terrorist attack of the 20th century. I had not ever seen before a twisted mass of reinforced concrete rubble. I know all about it now, because every time you turn on the television, something else has been blown up, and, um, you know, it's old hat, really. But uh, then it wasn't. Then it was a new, a new thing. Nobody else had the experience, anybody, I don't think, of doing that sort of thing. We had to propose silence from time to time so that we could hear and listen for um, people who had not been killed uh, screaming so that we could locate them and with any luck dig them out, in which we were not very successful. We dug out six people altogether alive. The sixth person was three days after we'd started. And we pulled out 91 dead, so that was the scale of the operation. It was huge and uh, most unpleasant. The worst part of the days that followed, the worst, worst part, was when they rescued and got a body out of the rubble, because the smell was unbelievable. They came in through the office windows, we had to close them, and it is a smell that I shall never forget. In broad daylight, dozens of Jews, Arabs and Britishers were murdered in cold blood by the notorious Jewish terrorist organization, Ergan Zwei Lume. The High Commissioner, Sir Andrew Cunningham, flew back from London immediately. The High Commissioner was dealing with a human disaster which crossed community boundaries. The dead included 41 Arabs, 17 Jews and 28 Brits most of them employees of the Palestine government. The dead British civilians were buried in the Protestant cemetery in Jerusalem. Brian Gibbs was one of them. You had to uh, carry on with a normal life because again I had the child to think of and the other two, but um, I think really the next day the implications of it hit because we had everything so well planned out and, and uh, this sort of deep disappointment that none of this would happen, that it, it was just cut off and I'd have to start again. I wish it didn't happen. I wish it didn't take place. I, I, if you could put things back, but. It, a war is a war. It was a war. There were soldiers. I was a soldier. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't meant to kill her husband, to kill the policy that her husband was implementing. I find that it's more upsetting to me now, 
perhaps even than it was then, because I know so much more about it now, and what led up to it. And, and I wonder how people could ever even think of doing things like that, even contemplate it. It doesn't bear thinking about, really. Anger led the British commander in Palestine, Sir Evelyn Barker, to order soldiers to boycott Jewish businesses. This will be punishing the Jews in a way the race dislikes as much as any. Namely, by striking at their pockets and showing our contempt for them. Begin ensured that these damning lines were quickly plastered around the streets by Agun members. He blamed the death toll, which had been condemned by virtually every Jewish organization in Palestine, clearly on the British. We gave an early warning for half an hour to evacuate the hotel. If that warning had been heeded, none would have been hurt at all. But the evacuation of the hotel was prevented by the men on the spot. And this was the tragedy. We never wanted to cause any casualties during that historic operation. CID had all kinds of joke warnings, um, malicious warnings of all kinds of events. What was there about this one that made it uh, draw the attention for, to evacuate the building? The so-called 20-minute warning was not enough, and it wasn't a very good warning. In those days, there was no effective system in place to weed out the hoax calls from the genuine. But despite the death toll, the operation was a success for the Agun. It was a fortress, and if you blast a fortress of the enemy, then, you know, it's like saying, checkmate. And it was a checkmate. It was a brilliant operation, yes. I, I never doubted it. I mean, if I'd, I was going to say, having uh, been a, a saboteur, if you like, myself in uh, Italy in World War II, and uh, committed um, a few horrors myself, and not quite at that scale, um, one had a certain admiration of um, people who did a job well. And one couldn't help admiring the fact that they did their job terribly well. They must have been brave guys doing it. It was well planned, well executed. That didn't alter the fact that it was the most ghastly thing to clear up. Following the King David Hotel disaster, a lot of us thought, we're not going to win this. That was my private view. It might go on for years, but I don't think we're going to win this. If that is going to be the mark, the benchmark of future activities, we couldn't contain it. The immediate response was anything but defeatist. General Barker ordered a series of large cordon and search operations. At Ruhama Agricultural Settlement, Eliyahu Kanani surreptitiously photographed the soldiers rounding up the settlers. They herded all the men together. They shoved us into the pig pen. We shouted at them. They replied. Of course, it made us angry, and both sides were spitting at each other. Major Cowton's men were looking for arms. We were getting a bit frustrated indeed, and there was one corrugated iron shed, and it was full of chicken manure, sacks. And we had all the chicken sacks moved out and piled up outside, and we went over the whole thing with mine detectors and found nothing at all. So I said, send for the dogs. Benny went in, and he sniffed around the floor, and it was hardly believable, but he sat down in the middle, and he went like that with a paw and laughed. I can only say that, and he did, and we dug. And six foot down under the slabs was the top of a cylindrical water tank, which itself was eight foot deep. 
and it was absolutely stuffed with every kind of weapon you can think of. After a three-day search, they unearthed an arms dump, cleverly concealed in a hole underneath a chicken house. As you see, it was a pretty good haul. The main thrust of General Barker's attempt to find the King David bombers was centered on Tel Aviv, where the stolen truck had come from. 800 people were arrested. But none of the bombers were found. Hiding in a house in Tel Aviv was the man the army wanted most. They searched inside, but Menachem Begin was concealed in a secret chamber that had been built for him by Shraga Ellis. The British set up a checkpoint in the garden where they brought in people to be interrogated to find out if they were members of the underground. Begin's wife, Alla, even served them tea holding her son Benny in her arms. After four days, the British left without finding Begin's hiding place, which was just three meters away from where they'd been sitting. The failure to find Begin was part of a wider failure of intelligence, which hampered all the efforts of the security forces. The Jewish population now mostly didn't speak English. They were very foreign people. They spoke only Hebrew and Yiddish mostly. They were tightly clannish. Uh, it was not easy to penetrate uh, their organizations. And so the supply of intelligence was strictly limited. The police intelligence used to indicate that something was going to happen, but they didn't know what or where. And so we were always taken by surprise. <laughs> We were in cells of three. Nobody knew the name or address of each other, uh, only nicknames. Uh, we met only in the streets, not in cafe house and not in, in public gardens, not in apartments, only in the streets. A young man waiting in a corner is a suspect. So we started to meet while walking around a block of houses one of us clockwise and the other against clockwise until we meet. So a man walking was not suspicious. The British became so concerned about the success of the guerrillas that they decided on a dramatic change of tactic. It was felt in the headquarters of the British forces that we should carry the onslaught into the Jewish camp. And by that was meant singling out somebody we could identify as being a terrorist and killing him on the spot. The answer was to call in men like SAS war hero Roy Farron. He'd fought everywhere and he'd been dropped into the Balkans and had a lot of experience of guerrilla warfare. He was very highly decorated and he was a very formidable looking person. I would not have liked to meet him on a dark night if I was his enemy. Farron recruited two special squads of policemen. They had to remove all traces of their uniform. He believed his men should mingle unobtrusively among the Jewish population as they searched for their targets. This meant wearing the clothes which most young Jews wore at the time like colored shirts and slacks. Farron felt he'd been given carte blanche to deal with terrorists. He inflicted a lot of damage on the Jerusalem Stone Gang until the thing became unstuck. He dropped his hat at the scene of one of his um, kidnap efforts and or arrest efforts and his hat, believe it or not, had his name written inside it. Somebody picked it up, took it to the offices of the Jewish-owned newspaper, the Palestine Post, and the fat was in the fire. There was a hell of a stink. The Palestine Post reported that a group of men, one of them armed with a revolver, had been seen forcing 16-year-old Alexander Rubovitz into a car. He was never seen again. 
There was then a tremendous uproar in London where it was felt that measures were being taken which were entirely illegal, which I'm sure they were, uh, and that um, the British government had to own to this and uh, take necessary action to see that such a thing never occurred again and that the persons who had perpetrated it paid the proper penalty. Farron was tried by a special court. But the main prosecution witness refused to testify. And there were doubts about how the hat came to be found at the scene of the abduction. Farron has always maintained he was somewhere else at the time. The court discharged Farron and he was shipped home. But the Stern gang had their own verdict on him. He kidnapped and killed a young boy. You don't do such things. He deserved death verdict. The Stern Gang had a long reach. They had cells in many European cities. They had also developed a new weapon, which has now become standard terrorist equipment. The gang instructed their London agent to post a letter bomb to Farron's family home. This was the first time a letter bomb was ever used. We sent the, the letter bomb and the address on the envelope was to our Farron. We didn't know, of course, that his young gay brother was called Rex Farron. So it happened that his brother saw the letter before Roy Farron, because his name was also Rex with R, so he opened the, um, the letter and was killed. Detectives scan all mourners attending the funeral service of Rex Fallon, killed by a parcel bomb intended for his brother Roy. This is all his problem. I know. It happens. Since his court-martial acquittal on a charge of murdering a stern gangster last year, Roy Farron has been threatened with death several times. The death of Farron's brother marked the end of the one attempt by the British to try and beat the terrorists at their own game. But the Stern Gang had bigger targets than Farron. They tried to murder Ernest Bevin, the British Foreign Secretary, the man steering British policy on Palestine. We wanted to kill uh, Bevin. He deserved it. Somebody who visited the parliament uh, on visiting days, and he had a bomb which he put under the seat of Bevin. He says that he did. This bomb never exploded. We don't know if it was found, when and by whom. Anyhow, we tried. Less than a year after the King David disaster, a chain of attacks and killings began, which contributed to the final unravelling of British power in Palestine. It opened with a high-profile attack in the old city of Acre, then, as now, largely Arab. A specially equipped Irgun convoy was sent to free terrorists held in Acre prison. We disguised the vehicles in our convoys so that they looked genuinely British. And our men carried British weapons, wore British uniforms and carried British IDs. We had to do that because our convoy had to pass army bases and checkpoints. Leading our convoy was a guy who had earlier been an officer in the British army. They parked a vehicle under an arch which physically joined ordinary houses to the outer prison wall. This arch provided convenient access. We used a ladder to get bombs and detonators onto the roof of the arch. With the help of more ladders, they strapped 20 kilo bombs to the grills of two prison windows. I called out, light the fuse, then I shouted, jump down. There were some power lines there, which we grabbed onto. I went down a bit too fast, and I've had a bad leg ever since. I heard the sirens go off 
And then there was a, a lot of firing. At that time, of course, one was wondering just how many prisoners had escaped. 29 prisoners climbed down to a waiting vehicle. They started to kiss and hug us. One of our officers called out to me. He came over and hugged me and kissed me. I had tears in my eyes. But the Irgun had made a serious miscalculation. Unfortunately for the terrorists, they had completely uh, overlooked this uh, party, both of police and um, soldiers, that went on the beach every Sunday afternoon. And as soon as they heard the explosion, they uh, made a roadblock. There was a jeep with a terrorist in it, dressed as a captain in the English army, and a number of soldiers, and then another big um, three-tonner. The last moment, the terrorists panicked and rushed the um, checkpoint. Nine Irgun members were killed, and eight captured. In June 1947, three of the captured men were sentenced to be hanged. Begin was determined to save their lives. He needed to find British hostages as soon as possible. Netanya was a town where support for the Irgun was strong. As Andrew Gibson Watt recalls after going there for dinner, shortly after the announcement that the men would be hanged. When we got there, we had a big table, big round table by the window looking out onto the street. And the atmosphere was extremely unpleasant. So unpleasant that uh, one of our number had a Sten gun with him and he loaded it and cocked it and put it on the table pointing out into the street. And people came and looked at us through the window. And although we had a very good dinner, we were very glad indeed when our truck came to take us back, back to camp. An hour after Gibson Watt and his comrades had left, two sergeants, Mervyn Pace and Clifford Martin, came into the same cafe for a drink. I'm afraid they were very naive people. They were very junior intelligence operatives. They had Jewish friends, and they were wearing, the same as everybody wore then, a white shirt and a pair of khaki slacks. They thought that they were undercover. They were not undercover. Everybody knew who they were. And the terrorists were looking at that time for hostages. It was not a good day to be doing what they did. On their way home, outside the town hall, the two sergeants, who were unarmed, were kidnapped by the Irgun and taken to a local diamond factory. There, they were forced into a specially built cell under the factory floor, which was totally dark, airtight, and soundproof. They were very badly treated. They were kept underground for, I think, 18 days, with very little air, only a bucket to do what you had to do, and very poor food. We threw a cordon around Nathania and searched every house in it, except the diamond factories, which we were not allowed to search, presumably because it was thought that the soldiers would put handfuls of diamonds in their pockets. It seems to us now a very extraordinary omission. The men were allowed to write home. Clifford Martin wrote, My darling mum, just another few lines to let you know that I'm well. Please don't worry. I'm afraid all this is due to my being one of the tools of Bevin's policy. Give my love to everybody. All my love to you, mum, your loving son. Mervyn Pace also referred to himself as a tool of Bevin's policy. But the British would concede nothing, and in July, the three Irgun men were hanged in Acre prison. 
One of those hanged was a trainee of mine called Avshalon Haviv. Just before he died, he wrote this to me. Commander, I ask you to take revenge for me. They tortured me. They urinated on me. The same day the three men were executed in prison, a group of their comrades sped round to the diamond factory in Natanya. They had to be quick, because they could hear British jeeps crawling up and down the street. The sergeants could hardly make sense of what was happening after days of limited oxygen. They were taken out and hanged, slowly. Not a quick drop, but a sort of throttling hanging on there. And it wasn't nice at all, but we all felt that it wasn't nice. The Irgun announced that the two men were being executed for membership of what it called the Criminal Nazi British Army of Occupation. We are not proud of this operation, but there was no other way. Tit for tat, and it stopped everything. Period. That's what happened. Nobody was kidnapped on either side later. It's a shame it happened, but it was retaliation. And nobody could sleep nights afterwards. It's unbelievable thing to, have, to make us do. Two days after the killing, CID officer George Dack, acting on a tip-off, led a search for the bodies in a eucalyptus grove near Natanya. I'd given instructions that whoever saw the bodies should shout stop. And uh, as it happened, as we were walking forward, I saw the bodies shout stop. The killing of the two sergeants was in many ways the climax of a guerrilla campaign that had sapped Britain's will. The information was that uh, there was a mine somewhere and it was thought that it was underneath the body somewhere. So we had a mine we were with us and we tried around the bodies but we couldn't find anything. So the captain went up to saw the bodies down and when they fell, the bomb exploded. It had been in the stomach of one of the bodies. The captain was knocked backwards and covered his face was covered with putrefied flesh. This is pretty grim. This is barbaric, in my view. The force thought so. I think the army thought so. The press thought so. In Britain, the publication of this photograph led to anti-Jewish riots in Manchester, Liverpool and four other cities. There was widespread looting and damage to Jewish property. In Tel Aviv, Thousands mourned the death of five Jews killed by angry British soldiers and police who had rioted in the city, shooting at buses and throwing a grenade into a cafe. Six of the perpetrators were dismissed or discharged, but that was all. Less than a year after the death of the sergeants, the British left Palestine forever. I would have thought that uh, the acts of terrorism and so on that we've failed to control or failed to knock on the head completely caused our earlier departure from Palestine, our uh, surrendering of the uh, responsibility of the mandate to a large extent. We chased away 100,000 people that came from 
4,000 kilometers to run this country. Jewish terrorism has taught the world something. Others have copied it. The British also learned from their conflict with the Jews, as they were to demonstrate when they faced guerrilla wars in other parts of the empire. Next week in Empire Warriors, British forces find themselves fighting communist guerrillas in the jungles of Malaya. It was a defining encounter, where intelligence was recognized as the key to success, in a conflict which threatened to become Britain's Vietnam. <laughs> 